All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar um, about teaching coding readiness to Head Start children, and in particular, a project that NHSA is engaging in and was is hoping you guys will join us with as well. I'm going to give just another like 30 seconds for more people to come in from the weight room and get their audio all set up, and then we'll get started. All right, everyone. It is so exciting to see lots of faces here. Um, and feel free to throw on your video so we can see each other. I uh, would also love if you'd be willing to introduce yourselves in the chat so we know who is on board here and uh, see where across the country you're tuning in from. I see some blue skies in some places, cars and others. Uh, so we'll see where everyone's at. Uh, so with this, I am so excited to welcome you all uh, to our conversation today. My name is Victoria Jones. I am the Senior Director of Data at the National Head Start Association. And I have been engaging on this project since the very beginning with these guys. It's been about two and a half years. Uh, so we're very excited that we're getting to the point of doing a real study out in Head Start classrooms and being able to start bringing this out to you guys and the rest of the field. Um, so most of the time today, you are going to be hearing from um, our partners on this project, about what in the world we are doing, why we want to tell you about it, and um, what we are going to be doing for the randomized control trial study uh, that we're hoping some of you and your colleagues will want to join us on. Um, but I just want to speak from the Head Start side about why we're doing this and why we're bringing this to you. Um, there are a lot of things I'm sure you know that happen. It feels like in a in a vacuum of research and development. And instead, this project that we're doing is very specifically what's called a research practice partnership. And the idea is that it's not just researchers, it's not just developers kind of developing something in their own space to meet what they think uh, a population needs. And instead, we have us representing Head Start uh, as the, the practitioners to really speak to what the experience is from the Head Start side, how things would or would not work in the Head Start space. And this project is really exciting in its kind of computational thinking angle, which is uh, like pre-coding skills. So no worries, we're not trying to get four-year-olds to like type up computer code in the background, but some of those, those skills in understanding um, how to fight through problems and patterns and how to kind of do these directions that computers and all this technology that we use today is using in the background um, is really going to bring this opportunity for Head Start kids to to see what's out there in the space around computational thinking and some of those STEM fields. Um, and we, we're really excited about this project and the equity lens that it brings to be focused not just on bringing those skills down to four-year-olds, but focusing on Head Start and similar kiddos. Um, and so with that, we've, uh, we've done a lot so far with these guys and we're excited to bring it over to you. So the, the team that is working on this, you see me on there, um, and actually Yasmina Vinci, our executive director at NHSA, for those of you who know her, is super, super jazzed about this project as well. Um, she's been joining a lot of our meetings and helping as well. Um, and then we have Joe Shockett and Cassie Reinhard from uh, CodeSpark. They're the kind of developer partners. And Christopher Doss from RAND, the research organization that is helping drive us all towards uh, how things really need to happen for real research. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Joe to start talking about this. Yeah, hey everybody, I'm Joe Shockett, like Victoria just said. Um, go over the presentation real quick. We're gonna spend about 10 minutes talking about um, what CodeSpark is, what this partnership is, uh, the project in general, or uh, Cassie and I are, are going to talk about that. going to pass it then over to Chris, uh, Chris Doss from RAND, who's going to talk specifically about the study and answer questions and, and go through the nuts and bolts of it. And then we should have plenty of time for, for Q&A and maybe even finish a few minutes early today and uh, let you get back to stuff. So that's the, the outline. Go ahead to the next slide. And um, yeah, you can skip this. So we'll start with the project. Uh, let me talk a little bit about CodeSpark, first of all. 
So I co-founded CodeSpark about 10 years ago with the mission to get a fun introduction to computer science and coding to as many kids as possible all around the world with a specific focus on underserved uh, communities. There's a lot of research out there that says kids really young can learn these concepts, even though they seem difficult. It's really important for them to, uh, to, to learn this stuff when they're young uh, because a lot of unconscious bias sets in as early as first and second grade that says, this person should be in STEM and that person should not be. And we think that's rubbish. So <laughs> we have to get to these kids early uh, when they're young and impressionable. And so we've had tens of millions of kids go through, um, CodeSpark is an app that teaches these concepts to kids, but starting with elementary school. And so we were really excited to pair up with, on this project, with Head Start and with our research partner, Rand, um, to go even one step younger down into preschool and give them the coding readiness curriculum. Um, so we've created the very first coding readiness curriculum tailored specifically to Head Start centers, especially underserved kids, um, classrooms, uh, students, and we'll talk about how we focus on the teachers as well. We're teaching foundational skills that children need to be successful um, in, in their life in general. We don't expect all kids to grow up and be computer programmers, but the world is changing, right? You, I'm sure you're reading and hearing about AI and are we gonna have jobs? And it, it can be kind of scary if you're feeling like your kids are gonna get left behind and all this. So even if they're not computer programmers, they need to be savvy in these concepts. They, they need to understand these foundational skills. The good news is this overlaps with a lot of things that you're already doing in your classrooms. It overlaps with math, um, patterns. You'll, you'll see some of our curriculum should look uh, very recognizable. And it's a great way to introduce literacy skills. There's actually a lot of research that says Learning coding and sequencing and those concepts can actually help kids with reading because reading is a lot about putting words in order as well. It's sequencing in a different kind of way. So it's touching the same part of the kids' brains there. And in case anyone is nervous, uh, th this is completely no computing skills or coding skills required from the teachers, from the kids, or from the parents. We are meant to be you know, the ABCs of coding. Go ahead to the next slide. Uh, awesome. So I'll pass Thank it over so to Cassie. Much. Yeah, to talk about what we're gonna teach. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Uh, yeah, hi everybody, I'm Cassie. I'm the product manager for CoSpark and our younger uh, content here that you're seeing. Uh, I used to be a preschool teacher, so I definitely know that knowing the topics, learning goals, you know, what is this really, um, I mean, the preschool I taught at had no technology, so uh, I get the perspective of that. And so I wanna take a moment to share with you uh, what kinds of topics you would go over as a teacher with our curriculum. Um, you know, what, what are the goals of those? And then what we're doing to actually teach that in the classroom. So the uh, curriculum that we've created includes seven coding readiness concepts. Um, it's, all of them are patterns, sequencing, looping, modeling, modularity, debugging, and one I realize that's not on here, which is spatial reasoning. Um, so these are all the topics that we teach, um, but as you can see here, we have uh, definitions for those. So patterns like you all know that as teachers, you know, actions that follow repeated steps, sequencing, steps that go in a certain order, like the ABCs, one, two, threes, um, and other sequences that might happen, like washing your hands, uh, looping. Looping is something that may be new to you that is a pre-coding uh, concept or coding readiness concept. It's just steps being done over and over again, like repeating. Uh, so that's one concept we teach. Another one is modeling, which focuses a lot on using symbols and flowcharts. And modularity is um, breaking down complex tasks into smaller ones. Debugging is solving problems. You have to break down the problem and analyze what needs to be fixed. And then lastly, spatial reasoning, that's thinking about and manipulating objects and 
two and three dimensional spaces. So um, there are quite a few different concepts that we go over, but I'm gonna tell you how we teach these uh, concepts. So if you can go to the next slide. Our curriculum has a total of 18 lessons uh, with an added bonus 19 lesson for review if you need it. Uh, 12 of those are whole class activities or even small group activities that take about 10 to 15 minutes uh, to complete. And those are unplugged. They do not require any technology, but they still teach the concepts that you would learn in our digital portion of, um, of our curriculum. Uh, with the digital portion, we have six different lessons that you will use or would be using to play games on a tablet through the CodeSpark app. And those cover all of the um, concepts that I just spoke about in the last slide. So I'm actually going to show you a video that kind of gives you an overview of what that looks like um, and why we created this video. Anyway. Welcome to CodeSpark Academy. Our app is specially designed to help your blossoming preschoolers think like computer scientists even while they're still learning their ABCs. CodeSpark Academy has partnered with Head Start and RAN to create one of the first coding readiness solutions for pre-K students. Along with creating a curriculum that integrates digital and physical components, CodeSpark Academy is also research-backed, teaches learning through play, emphasizes equity across socioeconomic status and gender, and is free for Head Starts. You may be wondering, what is coding readiness? Coding readiness is a set of foundational thinking skills that can help prepare children for future success in their careers. They often are related to math and reading skills such as patterns, cause and effect, sequencing, or breaking big problems into smaller steps. Why should you teach coding readiness to pre-K students? Coding readiness helps kids become better thinkers and problem solvers, can increase their cognitive and creative skills, and teaches them many lifelong skills, including perseverance, self-confidence, and risk-taking. Coding readiness also better prepares kids for future jobs, including ones in the STEM field, and helps reduce gender and racial-based stereotypes by introducing it at this early age. How will you use CodeSpark Academy to teach coding readiness to your students? We have created a curriculum that teaches different coding readiness concepts. Some concepts may sound familiar, and some concepts may be new, but don't worry, CodeSpark has created an online professional development to help you learn how to teach the concepts. Our curriculum integrates manipulatives that you already have in your classroom and a digital app. We will provide activity guides that are unplugged and plugged. We recommend teaching two unplugged activities a week along with having the plugged activity at your computer center to help reinforce what students are learning. Unplugged activities do not require any technology to be used. These will incorporate manipulatives you already have in your classroom, like magnet tiles, counter bears, and blocks. These activities are recommended to be taught in either whole group or small group instruction. These activities range from 10 to 20 minutes long. Here's an example unplugged activity guide that includes curriculum connections to the curriculum we currently use, teacher tips, look for questions, ways to simplify or extend learning, family connection suggestions like this worksheet you can send to families, and more. Plugged activities require technology to be used. These activities are meant to give you an overview of how the CodeSpark Pre-K app games work so that you can assist your students as they play throughout the week during their computer center time. 
You will notice that these activity guides are more for your learning and are not meant to be taught in small group or whole group instruction with students since we know that devices and screen time can be limited at centers. A student assessment will be given at the beginning and end so that you can see where your students start and how they grow after participating in the coding readiness activities. Teachers have so much on their plates and here at CodeSpark Academy, we want to make teaching coding readiness as simple as possible. We look forward to you teaching and learning about coding readiness alongside your students. After all, we are all lifelong learners. Welcome to Codes. Welcome to Codes. Awesome. Thank you. I will pass this now over to Chris. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Chris. I work um, for a nonprofit research organization that's called RAND. Um, and I've had the pleasure of working with Victoria, um, a whole bunch of people from uh, Head Start classrooms around the country and with uh, CodeSpark in order to kind of help uh, make sure that uh, this this curriculum is actually doing what we think we're doing and, and finding ways to get your feedback um, and how to improve it. So before we get into what the study is specifically, um, I kind of want to give you an overview of what we've been doing in the past two and a half years to, to prepare us and get us to this point. And so when we started this uh, a few years back, what we wanted to do is make sure that people from Head Start um, and all different types of people, we're talking about parents, we're talking about administrators, we're talking about students, we're even talking about the students themselves, the children themselves. We wanted to get their feedback as we were building the curriculum to figure out how to make this as, as easy, as fun, um, as simple and impactful as possible and make sure it really fit, uh, fits your needs. So just a couple of uh, things that we've been doing over the past couple of years. Um, we've received feedback from over 40 Head Start teachers, um, administrators, and parents in, in different focus groups. So what we would do is give them drafts of the curriculum, mocks up, mock, mock ups of the curriculum, so we can get an idea of um, what we're doing well, what we're not doing well. We were asking, what is the role of technology? How much time should we be asking people to be on the iPad? And how do you feel about that? And that gave us a lot of really good insights about how to structure this. Um, we then play tested with over 20 children. So we we had the games um, and we watched them and we had them think aloud to make sure that we made uh, had the best chance of having the games be really engaging for the students. And then we were really lucky to have the help of three teachers in Baltimore uh, last semester, last spring, uh, teach half of the curriculum. So we had, they taught nine lessons um, and they allowed us to go into their classrooms and we interviewed them and they gave us some really good feedback about what's going, what, what's, what's good about the curriculum, what's, what can be improved about the curriculum and be taking all that feedback um, into, into account these past couple of months as we got ready to this point. Um, and so the whole point is to figure out how can we have this uh, fit into your, your busy schedule, knowing that you guys have a lot to cover already. So the next slide. Um, and just here's some quotes from some teachers and uh, that we've talked to along the way. You know, one thing we were interested in knowing is, is how do parents feel about this? Um, and so one of the pilot study teachers last spring was talking about how the parents are actually excited because they were doing some educational games. Um, and one parent uh, or a couple of parents we even want to know, like, how do I get this um, at home? How do I extend this at home? Um, which is one of the reasons we want to extend, have those, those parent extension activities that you can provide parents so they can also work with their kids on this at home. Another, you know, thing that we were talking about is, you know, coding can, can be scary. Coding readiness can be scary for a lot of people, particularly um, if you, you've never seen it before. Um, and so we were trying to understand how people, how teachers were feeling in the beginning when we were asking them to do these things. And then, you know, at the end, after they gave it a shot, did we support you enough? Um, and, you know, I think we got some good feedback about how, for example, if you look at looping, that's very much like a, a computer kind of term, which can, can really kind of be intimidating. Um, but that, you know, when we worked with them and when they went through the lesson and the professional development, they they felt much better about teaching it. Um, and actually, this turned out to be one of the the uh, favorite um, lessons that that they taught. So it was really nice to see kind of people evolve from from a moment, uh, from some caution to to really enjoying it. 
Um, and finally, um, you, when we were talking about the value of all this to, in some focus groups, um, we got some good feedback back that this really does give them a firm, kids a firm footing um, for critical feedback and problem solving later in life. And, and like Joe said, not everybody is gonna become a computer programmer, um, but the, the idea is, can we, can we give kids a solid foundation for a lot of things they need later in life? Okay, so what is this study about? Um, so we, we wanna know if this curriculum that we built over the past two and a half years actually helps children learn the coding, coding readiness skills that we uh, think that we are teaching and that we have some good indications that we're teaching so far. Um, and so what we're looking for is about 60 teachers to help us with a study that's gonna take place from about January to May. Um, we're gonna do something called a randomized control trial. And what that means is that we're gonna have 60 teachers and we're gonna randomly choose about half of them to teach the curriculum next semester and half of them to hold off for a semester. And the, the reason we wanna do this is that we wanna compare the growth of the kids who received the experiment, I'm um, sorry, received the, the curriculum to the growth of the kids who didn't receive the curriculum to understand whether or not the curriculum actually helped improve their skills. Um, we are planning on doing this randomization at the building level, meaning that all the teachers, let's say there's more than one teacher interested in the study in a building, either you all would be doing it next semester or we'd ask you all to hold off um, on another semester because we know that particularly when you're trying something new, having a partner in the building that you can kind of problem solve with, talk to about really engage is important. So we really wanna make sure that people in the same building have the same experiences. And so that's gonna be one feature um, that we're gonna to try to build into this, to this study. Um, next question, I mean, next slide. Um, just to kind of give you like an overview of what the those months would look like. Um, in January, it kind of be like a setup month. So um, we would give you the professional development on the curriculum um, and this new assessment that we mentioned in that video. That assessment is how we're gonna figure out whether the kids are actually learning the skills. Um, that So if you're chosen to teach the curriculum, you'd get the, the professional development on the curriculum and the assessment. If you're chosen to, to hold off for a semester, you'd get only the professional development um, in January for the assessment. We'd of course give that to you later on. Um, in February, we'd give you a couple of weeks to assess the students with that new assessment. This would be for everybody so we can understand how everybody, no matter which classrooms there are, um, are, are starting off before the, the curriculum. And then those, um, those centers that were chosen to teach the curriculum would go ahead and teach in February, March, and around April, um, those 18 lessons. The ones that we're asking you to hold off, you guys would just kind of uh, just do your thing, do your normal um, uh activities with your, your kids, your normal curriculum. And then we'd come back and we'd ask everybody again to reassess their kids um, so we can see how everybody in the sample, everybody in all, all classrooms kind of grew during that time. Um, and then we'd also ask um, all teachers to take a short survey at the end of, um, the, of the, the, the period so we can understand how you feel about coding readiness and, um, and preparedness to teach coding readiness. Um, in between all this, what we'd also ask some programs, so these would be for the administrators, is some background characteristics of the child. We can get, if you're interested, we can talk a little bit more about that, but it would be things like the child's gender, the, their age, their race, ethnicity, things that we can make sure to um, make sure that we can kind of count for to, to really try to understand the curriculum and not anything else about the kids. Uh, next slide. Now, we, we realize that you guys are so busy and you have a full plate already and um, you guys would be helping us out in this. And so we really want to value your time. Um, and so what we would do is we would compensate you for the different activities that you would engage in. Um, so for doing the baseline assessments and the end line assessments, we would give you $75 for each wave of those. Um, if you actually teach the curriculum and take that time to do that, we'd give you $200. Um, and as a thank you to the building, because we're going to be asking you for data and things like that, we also want to give the building um, a thank you of $100. So if you're chosen to teach the curriculum, you'd get um, up to uh, $350. And then if you're not chosen to teach the curriculum, but you're helping us out with the assessments, um, you would get you $150. And then each building, whether you teach the assessment or not, this one would be um, $100. Um, and so we'll we'll leave it at that. I think we have some sample Q and A's too we can put on the um, board. So here is like just some things that we thought might be some common questions, and then we can open it up to you guys 
this is this webinar is also meant to give you kind of this broad overview where if you're interested and you have more questions that we can't answer today, um, we'll give you some contact information that you can contact me and we'd have to be happy to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with you all. Um, so, you know, some just a, some real quick questions. If only some of your teachers, if you are an administrator and only some of your teachers are interested in participating, that's fine. It doesn't have to be everybody. Um, we, you don't have to buy anything for this. We'll give you all the professional development, um, the, the tools and stuff that you would need. Um, the one thing is you would need to have some sort of tablet um, or computer in your class. Um, and it doesn't have to be a lot. It can be like one or two because what we've seen um, teachers do is uh, use this during choice time where they can rotate the kids to to do those app-based games. Um, so you don't need a lot of them, but you need some. And I think Joe said in the chat that it's it's pretty versatile. You don't have to have an iPad. If you have Android tablets, if you have hatched computers, any of that would, should be able to work. And, and what we've done on previous studies is work with your IT department to help get the app installed, get logged in, get up and running. Um, so we're we're more than happy to support you there. Um, Joe, there's a question: Does the Chromebooks work? And I think I think the answer is yes, but I want to. Yeah, they they do. Although um, my only caveat is when we have tested with kids, uh, we find that at this age, the iPad just works a little better for their motor control. Um, yeah, it's a little simpler to use than like a Chromebook keyboard and mouse. But the software does run on a Chromebook without any problem. Great. Um, we also are going to be asking you to, to assess your kids and give us that data. And then we'd be asking for some background data. Um, and we know that makes some people nervous. I mean, gathering data on little kids is, is a little bit nervous. So there's we've I've done some re a lot of research in early childhood. Um, and so there are ways we can collect that data without ever getting the child's name. And so we'd be happy to work with you if that if that's something you want. Um, and of course, parents always have the option to say no. We're not going to force um, any child to do this. Uh, it would be hard for for a parent to opt out of being taught the curriculum, since that's something you do with your entire class. But if a if a parent doesn't want you to, for example, to assess your child, the child, or gather data on your child, that's completely fine, and we'd work with you to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, and one question which I skipped is, what about those teachers who we we asked to hold off of? Um, we would give you everything you need to teach the curriculum the next fall, so um, next September. Um, and so we, of course, don't want you to feel left out. Um, and so we'd give you all the PD, um, all the materials and all that stuff um, the next semester so that you have your opportunity to teach, also supported by CodeSpark and us, um, to teach the kids. You wouldn't have to assess the kids, but we want to give you the opportunity to teach it. And with that, um, we'll stop talking. Um, and, uh, we, we will question in the chat for you. <laughs> yeah. Is all the data gathered by the educator or does the app itself gather data? Um, I'll answer it and then Joe, you can correct me. The app itself gathers kind of usage data, like how much time does the child spend on the app? Um, but that also, um, I think could be, uh, well, Joe, I'll ask you, let you answer this since you're the actual person. Yeah, no, that that's right. So there, there's you don't have to watch over the kid's shoulder while they play because we can tell what levels they passed, what levels they struggled on, how much time they spent. Most of the data um, that you'll be gathering is in those assessments, those you know, kind of fifteen minute, fifteen question, um, multiple choice assessments. Um, but there's it's it's not like you have to take notes as they're playing. Uh, or anything like that. Um, and yes, and then jo uh, Joe, do we actually have the kids' names in the app or is that also anonymous? We, we've done it both ways. Uh, I think it it kind of depends on the sensitivity of the, the study, the center, the teacher. Um, if we import, we can import the entire class and their first names and they'll choose from a menu of, of their names. If there's any sensitivity towards privacy, uh, what Chris and I have done in the past is give every student like an animal name. You'll be tiger and you'll be guinea pig or whatever and um, and match them up that way. Um, we can do initials, but but yeah, each kid does have a profile that they select when they play the game. That's right. Um, although we'll work with you if that profile, if you don't want the profile attached to the child's name, we can work with you so that what CodeSpark sees is that anonymous 
number or animal or things like that. So um, uh, a question about the IRB, great question. Um, so in order to run the study, we have our own IRB. For those who, who, who don't know, IRB stands for Institutional Review Board. Um, whenever you do uh, a research that involves humans of any type, um, big and little humans, um, you have to make sure that uh, get approval from the board to make sure that you are using the most ethical um, standards of practice um, to do to do research. And that's things like making sure that you're protecting people's confidentiality, that you give people the right not to do it if, if they don't want to, things like that. And so our, our review board has approved the study. And then I have uh, worked with lots of school districts and universities over the, org, uh, over the years. So if we need to do something on your end in order to get it approved by your IRB, I'm happy to do that and, and have done that a lot. Um, do all members of the teaching team in a classroom get compensated or only the lead teacher? That is a great question. Um, we were thinking the lead teacher, but that that does not necessarily need to be the case because we know the assistant teachers are critical. And so Victoria and I will come back to you and we can we can answer that question. Um, it all depends on on budgets, but I, if our budget can handle it, I do think we should also do the the, the assistant teacher and we'll we'll figure that out. Uh, we have hash tab, uh, tablets in some of our classrooms. Can the app be played on those too? Yes. Rachel, uh, they can be played on the hatch. They have hatch tables now, right? Oh, what's that? Did you mean tables, Jesse? Or am I imagining that? It does say tables. I guess I assumed. Yes, oh. tables. Um, I don't know if we've tested that specifically. I think there's probably a 90% chance it'll work. Um, because it's likely just a tablet that's large and kind of rotated flat. Um, so we'd be happy to work with you on that and try it out. Um, but I think it probably will. Yeah, I think um, the other question is just the dimensions of the table and whether it would distort the graphic by being too big. And would you have three or four kids standing if, at the table versus just one kid sitting? If uh, I, I mean, I would answer it like if you're able to download. Um, other apps from the app store or from Google play and the kids have fun with them, then this will work just as well as those. And I actually got a personal question in the chat, but I'm going to answer it aloud. And the question was, um, will the teachers have access to the curriculum after the study, um, like long term access to it? And the answer is absolutely. Uh, the curriculum is going to be free for Head Start forever. Um, and I think the thing with the apps is that the schools get the apps for free, but if families want to use the apps at home, I think there's a cost for that. Is that right? Yeah, that, that's been the CodeSpark business model uh, since 10 years ago. Um, you know, we, we started the company with kind of a, a dual mission of starting a business, but also doing some good in the world um, almost as a nonprofit. So CodeSpark has always been free for public schools and libraries, we have, um, you know, literally tens of millions of students play CodeSpark every year um, in public schools. And, and so this grant was just a perfect opportunity to um, extend the reach even farther through the Head Start program. And the curriculum itself, the PD, the lesson plans, all of that that we're developing will just be available for not even just the teachers in the study, but all Head Start teachers. There was a question farther up that I wanted to get back to, um, accommodations for special needs. Uh, yeah, thank you for that question. Great question. Um, yeah, I will say we're doing the best we can. Special needs is a very broad term. There's many, many um, uh, different types of special needs. So for instance, um, we do test with colorblind kids and we've made changes there. We do. Um, both audio and words on screen. So as far as hearing, there's very little reading in the app. So kids that are struggling with certain reading difficulties and developmental delays should not have a problem. Uh, my wife is a special ed teacher, so I, I have to spend extra time on this. I've tested with her kids with autism. They have a ton of fun with it. Um, but it really depends on the kid and depends on the specifics of your question. So happy to talk about that you know, offline or, or later, um, what your specific situation is. 
Yeah, we're getting some questions about next steps. So let's just put that on. It doesn't have to be the end of, end of the question and answer period, um, but we'll just, in case you're interested. So there's two ways to express interest. You can directly email me. My um, email is my first initial last name at rand.org, cdos at rand.org. Um, if you also go to NHA, nhsa.org forward slash code, head start code ready, um, that uh, there is a, a form that you can fill out to express interest. And that form is just gonna generate an email that goes to our team. Um, and then I'll just hand, I'll reach out back to you. <laughs> um, but uh, either way, and then, you know, we are, I think being chosen for the study, I think probably we'll be able to take everybody. I mean, unless we have like a huge demand, um, we might have to, um, you know, maybe so select some, but I, I, have, I have the feeling that we'll be able to take anybody who's interested in the study and then we would do the uh, randomization um, probably the first week of January um, after we get everybody, after the holidays are done, everybody gets their break. Um, and then we would let you know whether your job is to um, teach it that semester or whether um, it's uh, ask you to hold off for a semester. Um, and then if we ask you to hold off for a semester, of course, we'll give you everything that you need for that next semester. Um, if that doesn't work with your schedule, um, you know, this is me, try, us trying to think through how to like give people a rest with the holidays and all that stuff. If you, for planning purposes, need to have that done earlier, we can try to work with that as well. Just let us know. Uh, great question about the languages other than English. Um, and so the app is all visual and auditory based. As of now, it's just English. That's admittedly a, a limitation that we're doing. It will definitely be as we expand this, make sure it's um, that and done in at least Spanish, if not other uh, languages, Joe. But for now, the auditory parts of the um, of the app are English, and then there is no there's no written um, there's no written parts of the app. And the curriculum itself, I think, is just available in English right now for the teachers. Um, but obviously, those teachers that are working in bilingual classrooms and could kind of teach the lessons, do the activities in both languages. Right, that's right. And a lot of the activities, um, they don't have many, um, you know, you have your letters and numbers and things like that, but um, a lot of it's uh, with graphics and, and manipulatives and stuff like that. So uh, the translation burden should be pretty minimal for that. Of course, if you need wanted... something um, also to translate it, we can, we can help you out as well. That's not app-based. That would require a lot of extra work for them. I'm sorry, I, I think I cut somebody off. No, it's okay. No worries at all. It's just me, Kathy. Oh, um, I, I just wanted to address the question that came up earlier, which is, um, is this app student-led or teacher-led? Uh, the answer is that uh, it is student-led. The child can play the, the app on their own. However, you'll want to be careful not to just hand them the tablet and then expect that they know what needs to be done. So we provide um, activity guides that are for your eyes only that teach you about how to open the game or the app. Um, in the PD, you'll see how you can download that and get familiar with the games um, themselves so that if the child has any questions or becomes frustrated with anything, um, then you can be available to assist because you'll have the prior knowledge. Uh, we do recommend uh, having somebody there with them as they're going through it, but I am, we understand that that's not always available to you, but it does uh, help out a little bit. But it's not required for the child to be able to do the activities on the app. Um, great question. Is this curriculum something English language learners will be able to do successfully? Um, I think the unplug definitely um, successfully. Um, and Joe, I'll let you, you've had some experience, I think, also with different languages. Um, the Most of the app is, is visual and the only part that's English is obviously the auditory part. I mean, any child who kind of understands the um, English at the three or four year old level should be able to do should be able to do it just fine. But Joe, I'll let you add to that. If yeah, no, I, I agree. You, um, in fact, we've done partnerships with companies that were teaching English and they used our app as a fun way to expose kids to English. Um, yeah, you could, you could play the entire app with the audio completely off and not hear anything and not read anything and still be successful. Um, 
the audio is giving you clues as to you know tap here or um but kids figure this stuff out very very quickly faster than us adults right um so i think they'll be successful and um as long as the as cassie said the in-class instruction you know you'll want to just adapt that to their needs All right, I think we've gotten through all the questions in the chat, but if there are any more, feel free to drop them in. Um, we will hang out here for another minute or two just to see if anything else comes in. Um, and if, if you have questions, uh, I mean, emailing Chris or filling out that interest form in the app is not you committing 1000% to joining this study. So if you just have more questions um, and you wanna email Chris, throw them his way. Um, if you have any questions for me on the NHSA side and just like whether it's safe and trustworthy, I don't know, um, feel free to, of course, shoot those to me. Um, we're super excited about this. It's fun after two and a half years of work uh, to be this close to actually getting to really put it out in at least 60 Head Start classrooms. Um, and hopefully you saw in the video all the kids having fun with the activities and the games. A uh, couple of things, a um, couple more questions. And then also I want to mention that I think we're going to email you um, the the slide deck and a recording of the um, of the of this webinar. Uh, is that right, uh, Victoria? Yes. Okay. So if there if you missed something um, or, you know, you didn't drop down my email or whatever, feel free um, to do that. Also, feel free to forward that to people who were not able to come and you think they might be interested in it. They can kind of see this recording. We're happy to do that. Um, and then what is the deadline to apply? That's, that's a great question. Um, so we're hoping to get the recruitment wrapped up by the end of the calendar year. And, you know, things happen pretty quickly with people getting some well-deserved rest around the holidays. Um, but I also re recognize you probably want to go talk to your teachers about this and, and talk to your colleagues about this. And so, um, I would say if you if you think you're interested in it, if you could let me know in the next week or two, that'd be great. It would give us some time to have some conversations about whether it's truly something that could be helpful uh, for you with the idea of um, before uh, before the Christmas break, having um, our final set of, of classrooms that are willing to go on this ride with us. All right. Thank you all. Um, thanks for joining us. We hope this was interesting and uh, hopefully we'll get a flurry of people who want to join us. Thank you all for taking time. <laughs>